presentation um, is, a, is a group presentation. My name is TJ Kennedy, by the way. Um, and thank you for being here at the CSU Drafts. Uh, and I see some physics uh, people which are going to compare <laughs> what they did to what we did, I'm sure. Um, we have the Dean uh, of STEM Division in the back. Hello. I mean, hey. um, and we have our, uh, our five uh, research participants, which I'll have them introduce themselves and tell you uh, maybe a little bit about what their plans are in the future. Um, but we, uh, this was a single project that was done in parts, and so the presentation will be uh, a group presentation with each uh, individual uh, presenting the area um, that, that they themselves decided on. So, um, I'll turn it over to you guys. Good luck. My name is Rebecca Combs, and I'm a chemistry major, just straight chem. And so this is a little more bio than what I was, not what I was expecting, but what I'm usually interested in. But still, it was pretty amazing. And like we talked about in focus group, I'm looking forward to uh, undergraduate research at a four-year university. And so this really helped me prepare for my undergrad research. So um, that's why I was interested in being part of the internship. My name is Justin Nunez. I am a biochem slash pharmacy major. Um, I want to do a four-year undergrad uh, research also, and this does prepare me for it. So it's very beneficial. Come on in. The water's fine. <laughs> <laughs>
1949 wrote an assay, which is the technique that we actually use. It's on the board right there. We use that as one of the major backbones of our research to measure the enzyme activity. And this is another close-up picture of the enzyme itself. The one picture here is a dimer, or made of two parts. The one we actually used was a tetramer, so it would look like this, but duplicated again, so four parts. Here is our cofactor, which is our NAD. And if you can see these little uh, gray spheres right here, that's the zinc. Um, that's part of this whole structure. The main reaction that we are looking at here is ethanol plus our enzyme, which we abbreviate as APH. And the cofactor NAD yields acetaldehyde and NADH at 340 nanometers. So this is what we're actually monitoring in our research. And we use uh, SPEC20 to do that at this particular wavelength. But the only problem with this, or limitation rather, of this is that we're not actually measuring the disappearance of our substrate. We're just measuring the appearance of a product. So there may be some kind of limitation on if this enzyme activity is actually producing this or not. It's still a very reliable method. But there is some type of inherent limitation for um, the assay and this reaction here. This is just a close-up of the active site of the enzyme, what it would look like. So again, here's our NAD. Here's the ethanol, which is the substrate. And then that zinc atom is really right behind here. Um, just so you get an idea of the active site, just kind of some cool pictures. and the Racker unit. So Racker's assay, he used something called a Racker unit. And this is the amount of enzyme needed to change the optical density by 0.001 per minute. And there's a slight difference between the assay or the Racker unit that we use versus the one that Racker himself used. But over here is the actual recipe, if you will, of our assay. So we've mixed all these chemicals together at first. And we add our ADH, our enzyme, um, in our first kind of batch of stuff we're adding to the heat bed. Then we would blank our spec, and there's one in the hood right there, it's kind of covered up, but that's the machine that we're using, we would blank it, and then we add our cofactor. Normally, in a lot of enzyme reactions, you add the enzyme last, but the reason that we added it in our first, um, before we blank the spec, is because the solution can be cloudy. And because the spec measures absorbance, we didn't want that cloudiness to be interpreted in our data as production of NADH. So we're actually going to add this in to account for any cloudiness that may be there, blank the spec, add the cofactor, the reaction goes. From there, every 15 seconds, we would record our absorbance. So the first 15 seconds, the first 30 seconds, the first 45 seconds, and then 60 seconds, and then our assay is done. When Rapper was doing his assays, he took the 15 second reading and the 45 second reading to figure out what units he had. Ours is different in that we took the 15 and 30 marks to find our Rapper units. And we did this because we're keeping in mind something called the michaelis menten kinetics, which basically says that in the very beginning of our enzyme reaction, this graph is going to be very linear. And we wanted to account for that with, by changing the time frame to be smaller so that we get the activity in the very beginning of the reaction before the kinetics start being very curved and kind of hard to deal with. So we wanted to keep it nice in the very beginning part of our enzyme reaction, and that way um, we can take advantage of this michaelis menten So what we use in our uh, partitioning is what's called a aqueous two-phase partition. And pretty much it was established in the early, or the late 19th century by Albertson et al. And what they did was they used, uh, what he used, he used uh, different uh, weights of polyethylene glycol and different measures of salt. And he partitioned it, it partitions upward towards the polyethylene glycol layer. And so right here is uh, one of his uh, uh, graphs. And right here we see that we have a binodal curve. The binodal curve represents uh, turbidity. And turbidity is a cloudy layer of uh, pretty much a cloudy solution. And so these are turbid points. And each point is at different concentrations of polyethylene glycol and another polymer, which you use was dextrin. So these are different uh, poly points. 
And on this side of the graph, we see uh, point A. It has, uh, it's a homogeneous solution, meaning that there's no cloudiness, it's just all one single clear layer. Whereas above on these, what these are, are the tie lines. The tie lines represent a uh, two-phase solution with that type of concentration and this concentration. And so where, where you go on the tie line doesn't matter. You'll still have the same concentration. But it would be wherever the point is on the tie line would be the ratio of what you have in, in your solution. So we tried this with 48 different um, different types of uh, solutions. We first mixed that. We first got all the dry polyethylene glycol and all the dry salt, and we added it to water. And we tried to see if we could mimic any of the layers. So on all our 48, we sh we saw that there was no layers forming. So we started thinking, and we came up with two reasons why it didn't have, why we didn't show layers. The first reason is because we mixed it all together, so our delta G was negative, whereas if we mixed it separately, salt and peg, and put it into one beaker, we showed two layers. And then we saw that our tie lines fell really close to the binomial curve. So after that, after taking that into consideration, we tried it again, and we did find uh, uh, two layer separation. Now here is just another graph representation, uh, this time using potassium phosphate, which is one of our salts that we did use, and uh, polyethylene glycol, and we see different tie lines, different tie lines, and then different ratios. And then here's one of our videos that we had of us mixing the different, the different solutions. So here you can see that there are two clear solutions, but once we start mixing it, it, start become, it starts becoming a little bit cloudy, and that's how we measure the turbidity. And you'll see the reformation of the layers on this particular video, and notice the bottom layer is, is much smaller than it was in the beginning which indicates that some of the uh, ADH enzyme was partitioned into the top layer, which shrunk that bottom layer. There's visual evidence of that. And as you can see, it starts getting cloudy. So from that, we finally got our successful first ATP on this two-phase uh, system. Where on the bottom layer, you see the salt clear. On the top, you see a little bit cloudy, peg layer. And then here's a close-up on that. topic of aqueous two-phase systems. Mazu Suzan et al. showed that polyethylene glycol and salt buffer system could be utilized to separate the ADH. Now, their result was that the top layer, the peg layer, was rich in ADH and the bottom layer not so. This is one of the figures in the paper by Mazu Suzan et al. By noting this particular bar graph uh, binary, you can see that the molecular weight of PEG 1500 gives the specific activity of ADH in the top and bottom layer to be quite similar. That is, the partition coefficient were slightly close to one. This is what we're, uh, we're going to use what we used in the uh, in the uh, next experiments. So, taking into consideration that Master Suzanne used PEG fifteen hundred in a let's say phosphate buffer system, which this guy was eighteen to seven from Huddleston, and 
but they had to be in ADH. That's where we got the idea for, uh, uh, from Master Suzanne. Of course, the ADH was uh, diluted to 120 because it would have been very active. Now, we sent a few to that at 330 RPMs, and we got these two layers. As you see, the peg layer is way bigger than the salt layer. Of course, this is called the interface, the cellular debris, if uh, you can't see that due to the yeah, objective. You see that? Yeah. OK. And see how the partition coefficient is not slightly close to 1 anymore. We have pushed the enzyme up into the uh, peg layer. That's what's called the peg ridge layer. Now, of course, we centrifuge and then we assay. The assay is 534 RU, uh, the concentration, of course. And then the bottom layer is 62.76. If we're going to compare that to the crude ADH, that's 1,100 rack units. That's just half of this, right? Now, of course, we couldn't reproduce the study by Master Suzan at all since we used ADH. But Master Suzan used, uh, uh, and, then, and then we also used the 18 to 7 buffer, uh, uh, buffer system uh, as, as from uh, Huddleston. So that's why we were getting such low rack of units. Now, we then created a 14.8% weight to weight 600 peg in ADH, of course, the 120, and then a 21.1% weight to weight 18 to 7 phosphate buffer in ADH 120. And then you can see the peg layer and the salt layer, right? See, because that's a different peg, it wouldn't give us the, the similar uh, volume for the bottom layer and the top layer as the 15 did. Now, one, one thing that's interesting about this is that we took that interphase layer, we took, that, we took a sample from that interphase layer and we stained it with methylene blue. And we uh, uh, saw under the microscope that the cellular debris, the interphase, was blue. And that the protein, purple. Now, if we're going to compare this to the next slide, we just used ADH right from our stock bottle. And of course, this is some of the uh, methylene blue leaked onto the slide. So it's not all of it. So yeah, cellular debris stained by methylene blue to be blue. And then the protein is purple. Now you see that the proteins in this slide are not so clumped together. That is because in our previous slide, we used ADH. I mean, we used PEG in our ADH. Of course, we have to we use the salt in our ADH, but PEG is such a big polymer that it allowed this, that's what we're thinking, of course, that it allowed this clumping of the proteins. some of the results though, okay? So this is initially what we did. We took these results right from the board. They're right here for you, easy to see, but they're also right there. That was one of the first things that we did. The reason why we did this, uh, we wanted to see what the maximum peg and the minimum salt concentrations could be. So that's the first one right here, okay? This is the first data, uh, maximum amount of peg and minimum amount of salt. If you look at the second one, minimum amount of pig and maximum amount of salt. And we did this because we wanted to see our concentration values. We wanted to see what we could do and how we could manipulate it. All right, so you can see the data right there. And uh, John and Professor Kennedy extracted from this data that we needed to make a 40% solution of pig and a 30% solution of salt independently of each other. Okay. So we'll go to the next slide and we'll take a look. Okay, so here's what happened. Um, these are the results, but before I go over these, um, what we did was, with this particular one, we used salt and ADH. As 
everybody knows salt is a solid, so we have to you know, get it in liquid form. So we used ADH to turn it into liquid. And then we used a 40% uh, solution of PEG in ADH. Now, I know you guys probably have no idea what PEG is. We're talking about it. Um, it's polyethylene glycol, as I explained earlier. Um, it comes also, for the most part, in a, uh, in a solid form. So we have to turn that into a liquid as well. And that's exactly what we did. Um, the ADH was always in liquid form. So we just added the PEG with the ADH, or the salt with the ADH initially. What we discovered, though, was that the pH of the salt played an extremely crucial role in enzyme activity. Okay. The Rackard units, really well, all they're doing is it's telling us um, the enzyme activity, if the enzyme's working, how great it's working, if it's going fast, if it's going slow, and that's why we're using them. So you can see, if you see numbers, all that means is the enzyme was working. The higher the number, the better it is. That's what we want. But take a look at this one right here, top zero. Bottom zero, all the way across, bless you. Take a look at the pH. I know it's pretty small. This pH up here says 7.55, and we have activity. If you look at this one right here, pH 3.65, no activity. The reason for this is because this enzyme is also found in the human body. So, ADH, which is what we're using, which is what's in the human body, needs a pH of around 7. We discovered that after we ran these and we realized we have to adjust the pH. Okay. However, if we look on this chart right here, I'm going to show you something you're going to see in the next slide as well. The best result from this came from PEG 4600 with ammonium sulfate. You can see right here, 722.94 racker units. Remember what I said, the more racker units, the more active it is, which means that one you can take a look real quick. That one's definitely the best by far. Okay. So we knew that that was something that we needed to pay attention to. So if we look at the next slide, we did something a little different. Okay. We used the same procedure. Okay. We still did our 40% pig into a solution, 30% salt into a different solution, mixed them together. Okay. So we still did that. This time, however, instead of using ADH in the salt, because remember in the previous slide we did ADH with salt and ADH with pig. This time we did salt with water. Okay, so that was a big difference. And we also did the pig and ADH just like. Okay. Once we had, let's focus on this one up here. Once we had the salt in the water, we adjusted the pH. So we made sure that the pH levels were around 7.5 okay, or physiological pH in okay. So. Once the pH was adjusted, we start seeing these Racker units, or the enzyme activity, a lot more in, every, in, in all our samples. Of course, there's still some that, that don't have any. Right? But the overall activity was better in all the pigs, as well as all the salts, once we adjusted that pH. The enzyme wasn't being killed. Let's take a look. Remember, on the prior slide, I showed you that pig 4600 with our uh, uh, our salt right here, I can't think of the name. Ammonium sulfate. sulfate gave us the best results. And if we look here, let's just follow this right on over. Right there, we pay 4600, 641. Yet again, once we established that, we knew that that was what we wanted to use. Was the ammonium sulfate with pay 4600. Does that make a little bit more sense now to everybody? All right. You want to stay? No. All right. Sure. <laughs> it helps. Uh, just going to fumble around with it. <laughs> um, so after we figured out that ammonium sulfate and um, PEG 4600 was really the best um, combination, and it was very consistent, I'm proud to say that was the salt that I worked with, <laughs> um, you know, we went ahead and said, well, if, you know, we need to think about um, how this is going to be used industrially. So we did, ran a little experiment um, on a larger scale to see if it would work uh, using larger amounts. So we did the same thing as before. We did, um, but instead now we used uh, a larger amount. So we took a 100 gram solution of the 30% um, ammonium sulfate in the DI water. 
And then also another 100 grams of solution with 40% of the pig, 4,600 in ADH. Um, and then what we did is we put the two solutions together and we took a separatory funnel, poured the solution in, and we waited about two hours or so to let the um, layers form and separate from each other. And we got um, a top peg layer that was a little bit cloudy and then the lower salt layer that was clear. And we went ahead and assayed both layers. We found that the top layer had all of the uh, activity, so all the enzyme, enzyme was partitioned into the top layer, which was fantastic. Um, and we found that it had 700 um, raptor units, which again is consistent with what we were finding on a smaller scale. Um, so next, we decided to take the top layer and centrifuge it and then assay it too. Um, we found that the, it cut the raptor units quite drastically, so it really wasn't a good idea to centrifuge it, but just to let it separate in the separatory funnel. Uh, here's a picture of the separatory funnel with the uh, two different layers. The top is with the peg and the bottom is with the salt. And this is after we centrifuge. Um, again, the top is the peg and the bottom small layer here is the salt. So afterwards, we took um, the top layer from what we had in the separatory funnel, and we decided to do um, something called column chromatography. Um, and this is to see if it would uh, also separate the enzyme as what we did with the um, APS2 phase system. Um, so we used, what we did is we had a column, and how we set it up was we used uh, a few different uh, packing materials, uh, alumina, cephalex, aphanil blue, and NIM exchange columns. After we had um, packed those into the column, we added the ADH from the top layer that was from the separatory funnel. And um, next we ran something called which is an eluding buffer. And to see, and then afterward, after that, we then added um, a sodium chloride gradient, ranging from 0.1 molar to 3 molar, to see if we could locate where that enzyme um, was stuck in the column. Um, we ran several assays, um, but unfortunately we couldn't locate the enzyme at all, so um, the column chromatography really didn't work. <laughs> and here's a picture. Um, that's the column here with, um, in this particular one, we were using anion exchange, which is the white material that you see, and um, we're adding uh, drops of tris. All right, it's me again. <laughs> okay, you guys can remember from the very beginning of the presentation, Rebecca was going over uh, yeast itself and what happens. So this ADH is found inside the yeast, and we have to break the yeast apart in order to uh, get the ADH out so we can start running uh, all these different reactions with it. Okay. So there's a procedure that we follow, that I guess is followed just about everywhere, and it's this super long drawn out procedure. We use multiple different types of chemicals, and uh, we have to incubate it for three hours. Um, and it's, it, it's just this really, really long process. Well, on Wednesday, Professor Kennedy decided he wanted to try something different, and it worked flawlessly. And this might be one of the best parts of the uh, research for me, was discovering this. <laughs> Not for that one, but. OK, so this is what he had me do. OK, so I took one gram of the yeast, the same yeast that we used initially, you know, and it was that whole long process. So I take one gram of the yeast, and I took a mortar and a pestle, and I ground it up into a powder. Okay. Once it was ground up into a powder, I mixed the tris buffer, the pH 7.7, in with it because we still need it as a liquid. So I mixed the tris buffer up, and I stirred it until it was all one homogeneous mixture, just one solid mixture, no clumps in it. The solution was then centrifuged. And we have this really awesome centrifuge in the back. It spins super fast, and you can set the temperature at whatever you want. So we spin, up, we spun it down for 15 minutes at zero degrees Celsius at 15,000 revolutions per minute. In the end, the supernat, uh, the supernatant was assayed. So it was, we did the same thing we ran to see the enzyme activity. 
activity was off the charts. It, the whole reaction was done in less than 15 seconds. So we know that this way works, and it took me minutes compared to hours and hours of the previous way of doing it. So uh, we did a 1 to 20 dilution. So we got the ADH down because the activity was too great. So we wanted to be able to see what was happening. So we diluted it down, and we ran another assay on it, and it gave us 300 reactor units for a result, which is pretty phenomenal. So according to what, what I've heard earlier today, this is what's going to start being incorporated in at least this uh, school's biochemistry class. They're going to start having the, uh, the students themselves lice the yeast by using the uh, mortar and vessel, adding the trace buffer and spinning it down. And gonna have I can vouch for that. They're going to get their own stuff now. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So it's, it's going to save, it'll save us, well, it'll save the school uh, money because they don't have to buy all those additional chemicals and it's also going to save them time. So it's definitely uh, a win win. That was, a good, uh, that was really, really surprising. I can't tell you how surprising that actually was, having done this experiment at Cal Poly and, 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 and offered it there. And just the, the, the just tedious, time-consuming isolation, the enzyme. And actually, uh, further on, one of the areas that we wanted to look at was different lysing methods. We wanted to do some mechanical lysing, some chemical lysing. We were going to do some free structuring where we ran a bunch of free thaw cycles on the yeast and see how that uh, split it. But we, we ran out of time. Just like too many good things going on. So that'll be next year's project. All right. And then you're doing the conclusion? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I was just cutting in for my seat. All right. Here's the finding. So um, we found that the ammonium sulfate uh, was the best salt in combination with um, a peg of um, 4,600. That really showed the. Uh, greatest layer separation and enzyme activity. Um, and um, we also figured out that we do have to take into consideration the pH of the salt uh, when we were adding the two solutions together because if the pH is not close to 7, it will kill off the enzyme and decrease the activity. Um, and then we found that the aqueous two phase system, you know, you can make as small amount as you want or as large amount as you want. You will get the same consistent results each time. Um, and then also that column chromatography was really not an efficient method for separation. <laughs> really, really not. Um, increased two phase was really the best in this case. Um, and also that the mechanical lysis of uh, yeast is um, not only com comparable to chemical license of use, but it's much better, more efficient, and saves us time and money. Um, and also that centrifugation does impact the activity of the enzyme in the case of the separate from the experiment. I, I want to say one thing real quick. <laughs> Sorry. I should I apologize. <laughs> I know you guys are probably thinking, well, you might not even be, but I'm going to correct it anyways. I said 40% to 30%. Okay, and you're looking up here and you're saying, well, wait, this says 15% and 20% show the greatest layer separation. This, believe it or not, is the same as this. And the reason why is because what we did was we mixed these up independently of each other. So I have 40% peg mixed with ADH. And then another beaker, I have 30% salt with water. Okay. When I mix those two together, it becomes 20% peg in the total and 15% of the salt uh, for the total as well. So don't let that confuse you. The numbers are correct. I just didn't explain that properly. I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry. Uh, so here are just the references of the papers that we used and where we got our main ideas from. And of course, you know, our research was funded. Um, and thank you. Very much for <laughs> to the NSF Press program and um, for yeah. You guys have, have any questions? Yeah, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, it wasn't good as the physics was. That's not a question. <laughs> I, I, I think, I mean, I want to thank, obviously, Cal State San Marino for including us in this. Uh, what a wonderful opportunity for, for our students at, at, at this level to have 
this kind of opportunity to, to do really whatever project uh, that, that suits our mind, you know, whatever excites us. And, and I also want to thank you guys. I thought you guys uh, performed really well. I know I, I wasn't surprised by that. I, I know you all as students. I know you all as, as individuals. Um, so that didn't surprise me at all. But um, you know, the hard work you guys showed, everything you did, you weren't discouraged. You know, after the first day when we did 48 separations of different, uh, this is very tedious time, you know, mixing, mixing, matching, adding, and then to, you know, we're going to come in tomorrow and we're going to have all these layers and we even let them sit overnight because there's really a lot of uh, uh, disparity in, the, in how long these things should settle uh, before they separate out. So we said, we'll settle it overnight. Uh, I didn't even care about enzyme activity. I just wanted to see layers. And we came in, we didn't see them. And, and they didn't get discouraged. We sat down and talked about it. And, um, you know, uh, I was really, really happy to have you guys have a, be my first, my first uh, class. And, and it's going to, everything after that is going to build on what you guys what you guys do. So thank you very much for allowing me to be part of that. And you guys as well. And the physics people. And the staff <laughs> and everybody. Thank you, physics John. People. Thank you. <laughs> I have some questions, if, if you don't mind. Um, you know, bear with me here. Um, what does ADA stand for? Alcohol dehydrogenase. Alcohol dehydrogenase. Right, so let me go back to the reaction really quick. Yeah, I sort of. No, it's okay. I probably said it really it's, it's an enzyme in, in, in a biological system responsible for processing alcohol um, into acetaldehyde. And it, it oxidizes the alcohol to acetaldehyde, so you have to have uh, uh, you know, a, a corresponding reduction. And the reduction is the NAD plus to the NADH. And so we monitor the NADH production, which is, could be, uh, uh, it's, it's not a flaw with the experiment, but anything in any of the cellular debris and components, anything that's capable of reducing NAD to NADH would be interpreted as ADH activity. And, and so we did see that, and that's what really spawned this whole project with ADH, is that we put tertiary alcohols in this assay, and tertiary alcohol can't oxidize, uh, um, but we were still seeing NADH production. It was, it was minute, but it was measurable. And so we said, wait a minute, something is going on here, this, this, uh, we need a new method to purify and isolate this ADH. Um, and we're going to investigate that too. We're going to look into that probably fourth or fifth year on why this thing shows tertiary alcohol. But that's consistent nationwide. Everybody sees it. Nobody's concerned about it because it's so small compared to the uh, NADH production from the primary. Um, another question is, is uh, the mechanical crisis, you discovered that at the end? Rather than at the beginning? Yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and what happened was I came in um, the Monday that the research had started, the, the students had the Monday off, but me and John Hoskins, uh, we, we came in and we prepared everything. That way we could run all the activities. And uh, we had to set everything up, and it, it was a huge, long process of mixing together three different types of chemicals, so giving anxiety, well, some other stuff, um, EDTA. And um, while that's mixing, you take the... Uh, the yeast itself, and you place it in a blender. We measured out about 100 grams of the yeast, and we put it into a blender, and we blended it up. Once that was done for about two minutes, we blended. Once that was done, we uh, mixed our uh, concoction of chemicals with some water. We mixed that in with the yeast. We got this real frothy, gooey stuff, and uh, that's what we had to centrifuge, and we had to stick in the incubator for three hours. It took forever to do it that way. But once I did it by hand, and it wasn't it wasn't me, it was it was uh, Professor Kennedy came up with the idea to try lysing all these different ways. And uh, when we did it this way, it like I said, it didn't even take me ten minutes. And it was just so much more more rapid and so much you know more cost of it, cost efficient to do it this way. It, it really um, it really will benefit future. Was this a new technique, or yeah, is it yeah, something yeah, you've found in yeah, the literature yeah. already, or? No, we hadn't found it in the literature, I don't think. Most of the time they use like a glass beads. Or sand. They would, sand they would mill it, kind of, like, kind of like that for a while. And um, 
But the procedure we got, because we originally got this straight from Cal Poly, and so we copied their original procedures um, kind of to the letter for a lot of years and just never questioned it. And so then finally, last minute, yeah, TJ's like, let's catch, do this something different. It was so. a total catch-22 because the John and I sat down and we spent a lot of time discussing how we wanted to approach this because we knew that it was a very unique opportunity and we thought that if we could do something good, maybe we'd have some leverage for you guys keeping us on later on. You know, the comes oh, no, there's no danger. Yeah. <laughs> so we, we said, look, why don't we try and isolate, purify first? Once we have a good method that's proven to isolate and or purify, we can then use that uh, to, to, to isolate using other lysis methods. So where do you start? Do you start with different lysis methods and just pick one method to, to purify and stick with it? We thought it would be best if we found the best method to purify and then go and look at different lysis methods, knowing that we had full confidence in every step after that. So we argued about it too. He, he wanted to do the column chromatography before the aqueous two-phase. Um, <laughs> Uh, but we were both pretty consistent on there's no sense in us um, using a, a method to, to purify that's not proven um, and, and try and use that as, as, a, as, a, as the constant in, in a in very you have too many questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah like, we want to do one thing at a time, you know. <clears throat> so Now you guys are shaking your head. Oh, call chromatography. Yeah, it was horrible. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, we, we, you know, we, we could have approached that a lot better. I mean, yeah. the, the, the Cephidex and the Illumina are size exclusion columns, which means they're basically kind of like fishnets of different sizes. And so they'll only let specific size fish get through, right? So, and also the, something I didn't think about when we were in the preliminary phase is one of the classical uh, aqueous two-phase systems is um, the polyethylene glycol with dexatrap. And of course, Cephidex, the DEX on, on Cephidex is dexatrap. So was there some kind of uh, transient or ancillary interaction between you know, the peg that we were pushing down and the dex that was affixed to the matrix that caused, it, caused that? But we, we lost it and never came back. Um, we know we didn't kill it because we, we always kept the buffer at 7.7 7 in the trust. And we even tried um, reconstituting the media afterwards to try and, and pull it out, but we lost it. it we, we, we violated the conservation of mass. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Let me ask you another question. Uh, this is sort of a kind of a general question. How did it feel as, as you guys working with your professors in, in, in a situation where they didn't necessarily know all the answers? It was pretty cool. It was awesome because there was a forum for everybody giving each other ideas, bouncing yeah. off, and we were not just like told what to do, like now you do this, now you do this. It was like, what do you guys feel like? What do you think? How do we interpret this? And we started basically almost from scratch with a million questions we wanted to answer. So it was like, what direction do we go in? OK, we have this result. We have 48 things that didn't separate. Now what do we do? And it's like, well, we're sitting around like, man. Yeah. So it there was were no answers awesome. in the back of the book. No. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Because yeah, for me, it was, it was different. Because you know, I look up to John and Professor Kennedy. I, if I have questions about anything, you know, I go to these two guys. And uh, so if they don't have the answer, it's like, I caught myself, like I said, I've had uh, all of them except Amin in my class. Uh, and John, of course, but <laughs> and, and, and I would always, you know, say, so, well, in the process of class, we would be doing something, and like, say, Mikhail Smith, and so, well, why do you think the curve is that way, you know? And so, they've been accustomed to me asking them questions like that, and so we're talking about You this. already knew the answer. Yeah, too. yeah, but, but now when I say, well, well, why do you think the layers didn't form, and they're looking at me, and say, well, I know, I'm asking <laughs> you, no, no, you got it completely wrong, right? So, we, we, a lot of this stuff, um, especially in the, um, in, in when it comes to the, the, the percentages and, and what they wanted to do, there was a lot of latitude. The only thing I, I gave them was uh, just a little bit of direction and said, look, you, you have to have, you know, the, the published uh, data says you have to have your, um, you know, your salt concentrations in your PEG in certain ranges. And, and one thing, it, it, this may seem like a really 
kind of trivial type, um, you know, this data right here, but it was really kind of important because what I wanted to do was, as our peg is here, and, and our, you know, I've never seen it done before. No. Uh, we are here. <laughs> <laughs> um, if we have our, our uh, equilibrium phase diagram here, the binodal, and we have the PEG here, and we have the um, salt here, and everybody was using the same salt here, by the way. I don't know if that was clear. Um, we were varying only uh, PEG concentrations. And so what we wanted to do was find out what was our maximum peg with our minimum salt so that we could draw that timeline. And then if we went back to our minimum salt, and our, I'm sorry, our minimum peg and our maximum salt, we could draw on that timeline. And I wanted to see where that point intersected. Because I wanted to see what the array was. And I know people say, well, couldn't you just take the high and low and average them and you get in the middle? I don't want to get in the middle because that's just one point. I wanted to see what kind of array I would have across the, um, the, the equilibrium phase diagram on both sides, and we could work with that. But the problem was, in order to do this, you have to generate your equilibrium phase diagram using the clock point method, which is you, you take um, a solution of, of the peg, and you start dropping the salt in. And as soon as you see the turbidity or the cloudiness, you have to then record the concentrate, initial concentration of the peg, which is now diluted by what you added, the salt, and how many drops of salt you put in changes that concentration. Then you have to add water to bring it back to clear, and then start the whole thing again, recalculating from a different waypoint. So each time you do it, your peg concentration is going to go down as the solution is in the test tube, and your salt concentration is going to go up as the solution is being added. And I really wanted to do that, because I really wanted to say, look, the, these, these, these tie lines are very interesting because no matter where you are on the tie line, this is your concentration of salt and PEG. No matter where you are on here, it doesn't matter. But where you're located, if you take the distance from here to here, that ratio is going to be the, the, the ratio of the volumes and the layers. So ideally, you want to be right in the center of the tie line so that you have equal layers. The concentrations are always the same, and so, uh, but we couldn't we couldn't get that. Now it's, it's kind of, Not yet. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I, it was just an interesting thing that kind of jumped out at me because they say any point on the tie line has a you know a fixed concentration of the peg and the salt, but if you're here at this intersection, you're technically on a point on two tiles. Not at the same time, but yeah. there. Uh, that's what we were trying. That's what that max and min, because it's so much easier. You, you could say, well, why don't we just take your maximum peg and just add a bunch of salt in it until it salts out, or, or how do you get the maximum? It's so hard to visualize. These, these things are so time consuming. They're so, they're so uh, delicate. You know, if you put them in the centrifuge, the layers are gone. So for us, it was we, we took the, the max, uh, maximum concentration of peg and we, and we dropped the salt in it until we saw a layer form. And that was our minimum salt. And then we reversed it. I have a, another sort of question. Is that, is that I suspect this is sort of a different mode in which you operate uh, normally. In, in, in classes, you, you, you come to, say, a chemistry class, and you do a chemistry class, a lab experiment for like two, three hours once a week or something like that. And you're doing uh, uh, English and history and all like that and things like that. But in this experience, you you work, I guess, eight hours or so uh, every day, day after day on one thing, nothing else. You're not doing other stuff. How do that those experiences compare to, to, to doing it this way in a sort of concentrated format as opposed to sort of spread out over the entire uh, quarter. Well, you kind of need all those experiences from the quarters in order to do this. I mean, a lot of the stuff that I took from Chemistry 200, um, I had to remember because that's what we were doing day to day. So it's a little bit different because you're now applying everything that you've learned. And as far as lab goes, we used to 
people in lab during the semesters, we would write our lab procedures so we know what we have to do. When we get in here, we have to go as, write the procedure as we're doing it, because that was done so <laughs> Well, I can say this. Um, chemist, biochemist, food chemist, if we're not enjoying this, we're going in the wrong place. Yeah. <laughs> so this is something that we are passionate about. You know, I mean, these guys as well, they're going into the biology side of it, but it's, it's all the same thing. If you're not passionate about what you're doing, get out of it. You know, I mean, it, there's, it, you still have a choice at this point. There's nothing worse than graduating after seven years, ten years of school, and then all of a sudden you hate your job, you hate your life. So this is a great way to identify, and, and fortunately, um, Professor Kennedy and, and John selected the right people because we're all passionate about this this type of research and we all really feel really enjoyed it. Yeah, I mean, we really gain you know like real life experience. You know, I feel like I always think you know we're just coddled in the classrooms. You know, here do this, do that. You know, here's ten steps you need to do to get to this point, and this is probably what you're going to see. Here it was like, okay, well now you're in the real world. You know, here's kind of a guideline, um, and. You know, we're going to see what happens and to be able to come up with our own ideas and, and processes and things like that. Um, it's, again, like Justin said, it's applying the knowledge that we've learned before and that's what education is really about. You know, it's getting your knowledge and then being able to apply that in the real world and this was just the perfect experience to allow us to do that and that was really kind of the defining between the two classroom and real research. Thank <laughs> you.